Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Sit, Sip, and Synapse. We have a special guest all the way from the States today, and I'm super excited. We have Carrie Fitzsimmons. She's the mother of three young boys. She dedicates her time to caring for them and managing weekly hospital visits and appointments for her youngest son, Crosby, who was diagnosed with Marquio A syndrome at just under two years old. She's passionate about using the gratitude of I get to in lieu of I have to to show her boys the beauty in every situation. This positive mindset enables Carrie and Crosby to make the hospital a fun place to be at every week. Carrie strives to bring awareness to Marquio A syndrome while also helping other families deal with the diagnosis of serious conditions. I'm going to link the Instagram below, but you can watch Crosby's journey by following That's Fits on Instagram. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much for being on this episode with us today. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. So I think we can get directly into it and start talking about Marquio A syndrome. And I was wondering if you could get, if you can give us a little introduction to what exactly it is. Sure. Um, Marquio A syndrome is a very rare metabolic disease. And um, basically my son's body doesn't produce a enzyme that we all have. And so what happens is the lack of the enzyme um, trash builds up in the cells and without flushing that out um the trash builds up and uh, they call it trash <laughs> um, <laughs> in the tissues such as organs um and your bones so over time it causes a lot of problems such as um knocked knees bell-shaped chest limp wrists breathing problems organ failure um eyesight um, many, many, many surgeries, um, uh, skeletal dysplasia, um, and many um, children who have Morchio syndrome, their bones tend to not grow properly. So a lot of them are um, relatively short in stature and can be, some people can maybe think that they have dwarfism, um, but they don't. Um, some children, their, their necks don't grow as properly. So, um, it can look as though their necks are stacked onto their shoulders. Um, that's just causes a, can cause a lot of pain. And, um, so it can cause a shortened lifespan as well. Um, but fortunately now there is some sort of a treatment. It doesn't prevent the disease from progressing, but it sort of buys time to hopefully one day there will be a cure um, for his disease. So that we're very fortunate about because when Crosby was first diagnosed, um, I remember his doctor telling me that there was a treatment um, and explained all of that, but it, but he said, that the um, treatment was just a few years old. So, you know, thinking about that, sometimes when we miss a hospital day because of something, it's um, really great to think of like, or if things are taking extra time that, you know, many years ago or a few years before Crosby was diagnosed, they didn't have this. So what a great problem to have if we, you know, have to miss one or something because many other metabolic diseases in the MPS family don't have any treatment. So we're very, very grateful for that. That's actually very um, amazing to hear because it's not easy adopting a positive perspective to it. Um, the weight, the, the hassle or the headache or the stress that a hospital visit can bring on is like, is, is tremendous. And the fact that you're, you're looking at it in a positive view is actually really inspiring and really awesome. Um, Thank you. So you had mentioned that he had gotten diagnosed under just about two, I believe. Um, and given that it's, it is a rare condition, how did you guys first notice it presenting or how did it come about that you guys started noticing that something may be wrong? Yeah, um, well, for me, I, because I have two older boys, um, I'm very grateful for that because I started noticing, obviously, Crosby when he was sitting up, when he first started to sit. And his back almost looked like it was double jointed like he could almost hunch over and it would be like extra oh wow like a v and um you could see the spine curve and 
just having my two older boys, I noticed I'd never seen that before. That was just very odd for me. And so giving him a bath um, is when I would notice it more because of course he's naked. And and I was just, um, I just knew something in my heart and gut was telling me something isn't right here. So I pushed for answers. We went, you know, started with the pediatrician and then um, they wanted to take x-rays obviously. And then we were sent to an orthopedic. Um, this was over a year-ish of time. And then he was at first diagnosed with kyphosis. So basically his spine. Um, and so at that time I had never heard of kyphosis. So that was new. And then I was all, I was <laughs> kind of thinking, you know, oh no, my son's going to be like Quasimodo. Like I thought that was bad. Right. <laughs> and I thought that was the di di diagnosis. Um, but it, it was just a symptom of his actual disease. And so we, after he got diagnosed with kyphosis, he wasn't walking. And so we talked about putting a brace on him to kind of correct that. And, um, and then he had a really amazing orthopedic doctor and he said to me one day, um, okay, Carrie, don't look up Morchio A syndrome, <laughs> but there is a slight chance that that's what Crosby has, but I highly doubt it. And if he does, this is very unusual for, because he didn't fit the typical Morchio syndrome patient and because he's very, he was very tall for his age. His um, normally, uh, if you know, they would have hypermobility and like he could straighten Crosby out and then his kyphosis would, would go away. And if he was standing up, you couldn't see it. And his feet, I guess normally they would like curve a little bit and he would do some tests on them. And he's like, no, they don't do that. So it was just the spine. So um, we went to see a metabolic doctor and then they did some urine samples. And then a, about a year after wanting answers, we got our answer. And um, I remember it was the July 5th, uh, 2016. And um, it was the day after 4th of July and he, I got a phone call from Metabolics and my husband had taken Crosby in to get the urine sample. So I didn't really meet the doctor at that time. So this is my first time dealing with Metabolics and um, the genetic counselor called me and told me that it, we, based off of the urine samples, we, we highly suspect that Crosby has Morchio A syndrome. And I had never heard of that term. I couldn't even pronounce the name. I'm like, what more, more <laughs> what is this? And, um, and then she went on to tell me about it. And I just was shaking and I was in the bathroom and I was shaking and, and she was, telling me all these horrible things that could happen to Crosby and that he was going to face. And, and, and I was not prepared for that because I didn't think it was anything, you know, I mean, I knew, but I didn't, nobody wants to hear this. And then I was just so silent and she, she kept, it was like, it was like um, the peanuts and like the teachers talking, wah, 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 wah. And like, cause I, <laughs> At that time, my head is just, I didn't know just how serious it was. And um, she said, well, some patients can live a long life. And that's not what I wanted to hear. You know, that some, because when you're in that vulnerable state, some you're thinking, you, you just think the worst about everything, you know? So, um, so I had to, we hang up the phone and I had to deal with that. And I was just in my bathroom on the floor in a puddle of, tears and um yeah it was just really hard at that time um and then of course I'm 
looking up more Kyo syndrome and then seeing horrible images and then feeling horrible for wanting to almost vomit seeing the horrible images of what it can do to a child because you know the internet posts the extremes and worst of everything and so um I'm just like no no like and she she asked if I could come in um and the next appointment was two weeks away and for a mother that time you in that moment um you two weeks you you want to see them now like I'll drive in now I'll go after hours I just need to talk to the doctor and hear every single thing about this and what is going on and no this has to be a mistake um so how to wait two weeks and you know I practice some of my tools that I've learned and um you know, uh, fear is false evidence appearing real and to just wait until I go see, talk to Dr. Wong and hear what he has to say. But it was really difficult. Um, so then I met with him and it was just Crosby and I, and he shared with me everything that she shared. And I had many, many questions and she, and, and then he, he told me, like, I thought the diagnosis was bad. And then I said, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to hear, like, it's not that I didn't want to hear it, but, but I, all I wanted to know was, okay, tell me your best patient because he deals with the rare community. And um, he had some that were his patients. And he, he said, well, I do have one patient in San Diego and she, or he um, has has to use minimal walking assistance and she's a teenager and um, and that's like all I needed to hear. Like all of a sudden my, I told you about the shifting of zoom and like wah, wah, like I, it like brought me back. Wait, there's, wait, you have, there's, there's somebody who, who doesn't quite necessarily match what it says on paper because each case is different obviously with many rare diseases so unfortunately you know you want to know a play-by-play of of what to expect but every case is different so you hear the worst of everything and um all I needed to hear was that there's some maybe someone a little different and so that's that's what I grabbed that's what gave me all my hope and in that moment, I remember saying that Crosby is going to be okay, and we're going to be okay. And it dawned on me that just because you have a piece of paper, or diagnosis that says something doesn't, it's not that it's not true, but it doesn't mean that that life can't go on and that you, you aren't able to do life and, and, and that Crosby can maybe be the one who is, you know, a shining star, an example for hope and to just not let like a diagnosis defeat you and to, to, to beat it and like write, write your own narrative and your own script and your own story. And so it was hard for me because Crosby, um, when he was diagnosed, like I said, the only thing was the kyphosis and I kept saying, so you mean to tell me like, this is the, this is as like normal as Crosby is going to be. And then he's just going to slowly progress and get worse. That does not make any sense to me. Um, And so then he told me that there was some sort of, that there was treatment. And like I said before, that it's not a cure. It's not like, um, if you just, if you get the treatment, nothing will happen. It, it's the disease still progresses. Um, but then when they gave me, when he told me that Crosby would have to get a port and then he would go to the hospital weekly for treatment. And it's usually around six hours and it was weekly. And that was another thing to deal with because I'm like, selfishly, like some of the thoughts that came in my head when he said that were, wait, so every day for the rest of our lives, 
because I knew it was going to be me because I'm mom because of course I'm going to be there with them. We have to go to have to go to the hospital and we're going to be there for six hours every week. And so like we could never go on vacation, like just thinking of all these things and and for the rest of our like dealt with the life sentence. And um, that was difficult to wrap my mind around because I wasn't looking at it one day at a time. I was looking at it as a whole, you can never like, so every, if I chose Tuesday, which is our day, but for every Tuesday of the rest of our lives, we will be in the hospital. Like that's the way that I was looking at it at that time, because everything was so overwhelming and fearful and scary, you know, but luckily our, his doctor is amazing. And, um, you know, I, I told him, I, now I have this relationship with them. He's no longer his doctor because we moved states, but that when he first told me, I just wanted to like, I hated him, but I loved him all at the same time. Like, <laughs> you know, you, you don't want somebody who's going to deliver that news to you, but he, he stayed in the room with me forever. And he even told me, I'll stay in here until you, until you're ready to leave. Like, it was good hour that we were there. And he said he would have stayed even longer with me. So he got to see me cry. He got to see me tell him, I don't believe this. You know, he got to see me get very hopeful and tell him that this isn't, you know, Crosby's going to be different and God is going to heal him. And, um, and he got to, and then to now he's seen us on our journey. And so it's really great. I text them and stuff. <laughs> so amazing. we're friends. It's amazing. really great. Honestly, that's a really inspiring and powerful story. And thank you so much for being so honest. Like a lot of that isn't easy to admit. And you came, it seems like you guys came a, like a very long way from where you began. And it's really, really awesome to hear. Um, and I'm sorry you went through all the things you went through in the beginning, uh, just to maybe build up on that. Like you had said, the first phone call you got was, really really hard and had you crying on the floor do you feel like if that was delivered in a more thoughtful manner like had she or he brought you into their office sat you down had taken a little more time it would have been different or like would it have not different but would you have felt maybe a little more supported or was it just the intensity of what the news that was delivered and that wouldn't have the, the interaction with the healthcare professional wouldn't have changed anything uh yes look yes it would have been more helpful um if somebody brought that news on to me now um with where i am in my journey with everything i i probably could have handled it differently uh maybe i don't know but yeah back then when you're receiving news like this i mean i was literally going to the bathroom to go pee <laughs> 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 and I see a call on my cell phone and I, I'm like, okay, I think this is chalk. And so I, I call, I answer it and um, I'm going to, the, I'm going pee while she's calling <laughs> me. And, and, and so it was a bad time, but it was, what, what time is a good time? There really isn't a good time. So yeah. I don't think she intentionally, I mean, of course, who wants to deliver that news? Yeah. Um, I just wish that, you know, because I don't, I can't, I can't speak for other moms, but my question was, well, all I wanted to know was, was he going to die, you know? Um, and I know she couldn't say no or a yes, but the answer that she gave me wasn't a no, he won't. It was, that was the part that was the worst. And then just hearing all the medical terms. I don't know. I didn't know medical terms. I didn't know. What, so she's saying multipolysaccharidosis. And, um, and I'm like, Wait, what? I'm like trying to write in my phone and like write down these notes. Okay. So, so this is what's going to happen. And, and then I don't know any, so I'm paying attention to the medical terms more because I don't want to miss out than I am on what's really happening. Like I, you know. Yeah. I, I think that's like also an instant response of like, when we're in shock, we're just trying to like take in everything. And it's like, 
I think, and I think we learn on our part as healthcare professionals, at least um, trying to simplify things and delivering it in a manner that, that you can understand so that you can at least take it in while also coming to terms with how you're feeling. And that gets, just makes it easier for you guys, but it's just harder to deliver in practice. And I think we just have to practice that and that hopefully will make things like this easier on you guys. Yeah. Um, I think also maybe having a um, appointment set up for maybe a couple days later, an earlier appointment would have been helpful. Absolutely. Too. Yeah. Because like, the provider is like, you know, his doctor knows it's not a, it's, it's not something that you have to rush overnight, but as a mother or, you know, could be a father or caretaker, you, it is something that needs to be fixed and taken care of overnight. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is your world and Mm -hmm. you need answers. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I was wondering if we can maybe talk a little bit more about the syndrome itself and the impact it had on Crosby's life. Have you noticed maybe just how it's like impacted his like childhood as in terms of like everything he's been able to do or not been able to do or how he's seen it and how's he, how he's dealing with it? Uh, sure. Crosby, Crosby knows what he has and um, uh, he it hasn't really, it, it's impacted him in a positive way um, because we are very fortunate that Crosby ha- is the same as he was before his diagnosis. His kyphosis has basically corrected itself. Wow. Um, I do notice when he sits or when he hunches over, I could see it, but it goes away when he stands up. He ha- doesn't have any issues with posture or anything. And he is taller than most kids his age, not just kids who have Morchio syndrome. And um, one of the reasons for the treatment to receive the synthetic enzymes is, um, is for stamina. And a lot of children who have Morchio don't have the energy. And so they would measure to see at the beginning, they would measure to see if it was if the enzymes were working by like a two minute walk test. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to see how far and um, how they could walk. And so, but Crosby never had that. He was our kid who, you know, we'd be at Disneyland and he was two and a half and would refuse the stroller while his older brothers would be like, sweet, I'm going in the stroller. (laughs) So he can outlast any of us and he's our like tank. So, so, and I know that I can only speak for us because many of our other friends who we've built a community, um, you know, Morchio syndrome and, and all, some of our other friends aren't there, you know, we're all on our different journeys with Morchio syndrome. Like I said, everybody's journey is going to be different. So for Crosby, I could only speak for him. He has, he, I don't see any difference before or since now he's going to be seven in August. So, but he has seen it as such a positive thing. So what started out as, you know, when he first got his first um, uh, port surgery and then his, his first enzyme replacement therapy where he was kicking and screaming and did not want to go to the hospital. Um, Now he just loves the hospital. So he, he, at one point during his journey, it was a a couple years back, um, there was another little boy who had, who was there for oncology and they became friends and he saw that he had a port. And so that was really cool. But they, what I noticed is like Crosby started talking about how all kids have ports. So, and all kids go to the hospital. So, you know, Grafton and Ames, when they used to go to the hospital, Grafton and Ames are his older brothers. So he just assumed that everybody has a port and everybody goes to the hospital. And, um, but he's seen it, he sees it in such a positive way. First of all, we go on Tuesdays. So when he started kindergarten and preschool, he got to miss school. So he, we started calling we used we call it infusion tuesday with crosby but we him and i would call it ditch day so (laughs) you know he'd be in kindergarten and we'd 
we'd go to school for drop off and he'd say, bye Grafton, bye AMC. And like, they'd look back and go, it's not fair. You get to go to the hospital. And, <laughs> and Crosby was like, yeah. Um, but so he sees it as a positive thing. And he, he, his first best friends were nurses. So he just speaks their language and he loves to flirt and he <laughs> loves to get on the loudspeaker and, you know, do crank, crank calls to the nurses. He started doing that when he was two and a half and um, he just makes the most fun of it. And of course, you know, when he was little prizes were such a big deal at the end. I mean, chalk used to give away presents like, I'm like, we don't have any more room in our house. Was little like rinky dink doctor's visit things, but they were like gifts. And and then they and then they they stopped that and Crosby started going, wait, no, I want to go in that room. Toy. But eventually um he got used to it and I was happy that we weren't bringing on big toys, but but everything like that made it magical. So he he loves the hospital. I mean, we could opt for home infusions. He will not allow that because he just loves being there. He loves getting waited on. It's his love language. He loves uh, the conversations with the nurses. And I always joke and say that one day when he's an adult, I'm going to have to have a talk with his spouse about like, you know, when, you know, we talk, joke about the man flu. Like when Crosby gets the flu, you're going to have to wait on him because <laughs> he just, that's his love language. That's what he's grown up with. Like, here's five otter pops and here's like, he just loves it. It's and funny. he should because he goes through a lot. And so I used to at first go, no, you know, that's enough. You don't need that. And then I realized, no, embrace it. it that's what makes it so special let him have it. Let him. Tuesday is just the most special day ever. And I've grown to love it. So it's, it's such a positive thing. I'm, we probably got off track. Sorry. No, that was amazing. That was an amazing story. You don't often hear uh, kids loving the hospital. So just hearing this, especially someone who has to go like weekly, this is actually so awesome. And it just speaks to the power and the influence, like a good hospital staff and a good environment and good interactions can have on, yeah. on patients. It's incredible. At first when um, Crosby we'd have to have a few nurses hold him down and I to hold him in my lap. And it was the worst because he would be kicking and screaming and crying. And then they'd insert the needle that's like this long and thick into his port. And I swear it felt like they were piercing me too, because I could, he's just looking at me like, mommy, like, aren't you? And I'm just allowing it. But then after a while, um, we started just letting him, even if it took 45 minutes, letting him have control of when he was ready to do it. That made a huge difference. And he would, you know, tell the nurses, okay, we're, we're going to count to 15. And then he'd go, he'd, they'd count and then they'd get to 15. And then he'd say other things, you know, now we're going to count by twos or something. And <laughs> It was just manipulation to <laughs> not have to take, cause he'd have to take oral meds before, but then the doctor approved that we didn't have to do oral meds anymore. And so he just got his port access and he'd rather do that any day. Now he's a professional. He just sits there. He could do an iPad, hold up conversation, eat Doritos and just sit back and you would never ever know. And so He's kind of a pro. <laughs> so cool to hear. Honestly, it just makes me laugh hearing. I can just picture him doing all this. It's quite funny. Um, I was just curious in terms of all this, like there's a lot of positives to it. And I'm like super grateful, like happy to hear that there's a lot of positives. But did you in your journey ever encounter any type of like stigma or misconceptions um, that you guys had to endure because of the syndrome that he has or because of all these hospital visits? Um. Well, yeah, sometimes people think that it's um, sort of like he just goes and then he receives treatment and then he's okay. 
and um and I like and and it's nobody's fault for thinking that because I don't expect people to really dig deep and dive into what Morchio syndrome is all about but when it's simplified so simple because he's doing so well um it kind of I, I have to, I find myself wanting to correct them. Like, no, it's, it's not um, simple as, as these enzymes just are a fix all because they're not, it's just Crosby is doing so well that he makes it look like that's, that's a cure. And he, you just go in every week. And as long as you get this, then you're going to be fine. And while I shouldn't that shouldn't bother me because it does, because he's doing so well, like that's the bottom line. Um, it's just, I guess for me, I just, for me, it's more of a spiritual journey because I had to give, it was really hard at first. I had to, um, I just wanted to fix him overnight. So I was up hours and hours, no sleep, just trying to figure out how to fix my son and cure him myself. Cause I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to cure him. He's going to be okay. I'm going to figure it out, you know? And so, um, I just, I, I was up all the time. And then I realized that, you know, God spoke to me and just told me to, um, surrender Crosby to him and that he would be okay. Um, but that was really hard because that would mean giving up control and being the one and just trusting in some in God in that way uh, was very hard and, uh, you know, uh, tug of war. And then I finally surrendered Crosby to him and I felt such peace in my heart and I knew everything was going to be okay. And that's when my whole like outlet and mindset changed. And every morning, I swear, when I would wake him up, it was like, I saw that in Crosby and he would hug me. And it was like, God's promise was there and that he was going to be okay and to keep trusting and believing. And so it was really hard at first. And then when I, when I let go and let God and just gave, gave Crosby to him, then everything started to change. And now I don't even really look at Crosby and think he has Morchio syndrome uh, or he's a very rare disease. I don't look at him like that. I, I see him, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't get special attention at home. He, we let him wrestle and do everything, but I, I see him and I just, I have to be reminded that he has, I remember on Tuesdays, that he has Morchio. And in fact, now it's come to the point that, that I remember on Tuesdays, we're at the hospital and he loves it so much. And why are we, oh yeah, he has Morchio. <laughs> Where before that's all I thought of. And, and I would see him and then all of a sudden I'd see the disease. Like I saw it, I like, and it was so hard and I'm like, Carrie, snap out of it. And so for me, the, so when people ask, or people think that it's the enzyme that's why he's doing so well. I know that he's doing so well doesn't matter, but I know that it's really God and his promise. And so that's where I want to just like give him the glory. And yeah, the treatment, I'm sure it's helping. And I kind of now see it as a, you know, maybe Crosby is cured, but um and the beauty of it is, is that he gets to go to the hospital and who knew that that was his favorite place in the whole entire world. So it doesn't really matter. He's doing well and he gets to be at his favorite place every week. And I get to be there and watch him and just be on this journey with him. So it's actually beautiful now. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was very personal. And it's really, it's, it's great to see the growth you've done with yourself and that you finally found something that helps you through it. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you.
I know there's a lot of positives and it's absolutely fine if you don't have any negative stories, but do, can you think of like a negative experience um, within the healthcare system that you guys had to go through that maybe makes you think or have suggestions for what we can do to give better care for people with rare conditions or families in general that come in with situations similar to yours? Um, yeah, actually I do. So a lot of when we used to go to, Crosby now gets admitted into the hospital because now we're at Dell Children's in Austin. And before that, we were at Chalk Children's in Orange County, California. And um, Chalk Children's is an amazing place. Uh, they are forever my home away from home. Um, and Crosby used to receive his synthetic enzymes in the outpatient infusion center. and. Most kids who were even at the hospital Crosby's at now, his floor is mostly oncology. So he's he's always around children with, who are in oncology. And a lot of the times we would check in, this was an OPI and there'd be flyers for, for you know, go like everybody with on, in the oncology unit, um, we're having this special day at the Angel Stadium, meet all the players or a camp, or we're going to have a dance or a big get together or meet um, Justin Bieber for the on call. And it was all like in your face that it was there and that it was available. And sometimes I'd pick up the flyers and I'm like, oh my gosh, this would be so fun to do. And, you know, to bring his brothers into it too, because even though they're, they don't have more gear, they still have to sacrifice. And so, um, and then I would be reminded or told that, oh, this is only for oncology um, patients. And it was really hard to, to sit with that because you would feel feelings of feeling like weird, like selfish or like to think, cause you know, I don't, I don't wish cancer on anybody or, or, or Morchio syndrome or anything on anybody but you would feel almost like because Morchio syndrome is so rare that, and there's not a lot of knowledge about it, that he, he doesn't qualify, like he, he doesn't um, receive chemotherapy, but, but who's to say that it's not as hard or hard in a different way for him, yeah. that there should be more inclusive events than, um, than just specific to, uh, I want to be very kind here, um, but more of a popular disease. You know what I'm saying? More of yeah. a, a disease that is more well known, where and it's well yeah. known. Yeah, yeah. And so that brought a lot of mixed feelings because you want to advocate for your kids, and I'm I'm very much a believer in that. But you don't know well how to in that particular place because you don't want to be like, oh well this sh why can't my son go and then cause a problem but you feel a little bit sad that he can't and that we live in you know this was a few years back but 2021 we should be better than that in a way but I know that people who put those flyers out they're not thinking they might hurt somebody or it's not that it hurt my feelings it was more like oh we could not participate if we wanted to, but it's in our face. It's like right there, the flyers to see. Um, so it was like the community that you kind of desired wasn't there. And so, but it was really great because we've gotten to meet several teenagers. Um, in fact, I still speak with several of them from Crosby's old hospital who um, had other rare diseases mm -hmm. and they they weren't in the oncology unit, but so we got to talk about it and then kind of bring more awareness to, you know, they were feeling those same feelings, but they didn't know how to advocate for it. So we were able to bring it to the proper attention and sort of share that. And now, I mean, it's really great because I still talk to those teenagers. I become like their mom <laughs> and, and like, it's really cool, but yeah, those kind of things. I guess if if that is even anything negative, uh, I mean it. It yeah, if it answers the question in that sort of a way, Crosby hasn't 
been looked at or stigmatized in any way. Um, but yeah, the, in that sort of way. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think the the takeaway I'm taking from that is just providing care that's more inclusive and not just care, but just like the environment and surroundings. Um, and it's okay if we do it out of not being aware, but once that is brought to our attention or once we like gain knowledge on it, it, it just helps to include everybody regardless of, it, it, I guess it's like hard to put this into terms, but just creating an inclusive environment and like a community for everybody to be, to feel like they're part of. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when rare diseases are so rare, there's not going to be a big community, you know? Yeah, and, yeah exactly. And, in each little pocket hole of yeah. the hospital. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's all the questions I really have in terms of, of you guys and your journey and Crosby. Is there anything you would like to add? Um, well, yeah, I, yeah. So Crosby and I, we've, on, along this journey, we've realized that the hospital is a really, really fun place. And a lot of times the hospital gets a bad rep. You don't want to be there, um, that it's just full of germs that, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, you want to get in and out as soon as possible and never be back. But in our, for us, a Crosby's had a few surgeries and everything. Um, but for us, we've, the hospital has been a really, really fun place. And it's been the nurses have become family that I never knew I needed. And um, they've become, they were Crosby's best friends, first best friends. Crosby still calls his old hospital, sometimes on Tuesdays to prank call the nurses and talk <laughs> to them and tell them how he's gonna marry nurse Laura. And <laughs> they're, they've all, um, you know, in a way the hospital has helped raise Crosby one day when he's an adult, he's going to have an incredible story about growing up at the hospital. He's like the face of a hospital, you know, mm -hmm. and the, the footprints that all the nurses have left in his heart and my heart. And they have really helped. They're, they're, they're kind of like a, an aunt or a family member, but a very, very positive one. And so for us, the hospital has it's not just about the facility or, you know, the activities that go on. It's about the personal relationships with the nurses. And um, that is where the hospital is amazing and why it is our favorite place to be on Tuesdays. And um, so that's what we found out. And that, you know, sometimes we leave and a security guard says, sweet, you're out of here. Like, don't have to come back again. And, and I realized that everybody thinks the, like everybody wants to leave the hospital. I'm like, you don't realize my son would sleep here. <laughs> <laughs> like he wants to sleep here overnight. So I'm just so grateful that he loves it so much because what a blessing that is that he sees it as a privilege. And so because he sees it as a privilege, I get so much joy out of it. So our message has turned from, you know, we want to bring awareness to Morchio A syndrome. Um, that's what Crosby has. And we want to find a cure for it. Um, but this is what he has. And this is these, this is what what we our message now is that this is what you have, and you can make the best of it by it's all in your perspective, how you look at things. And Crosby, I never told him, but he's chosen to find so much joy at the hospital. And he has changed my view of so many things in life to now, oh, I don't, I have to go to the hospital. Oh, I get to go to the hospital. We get to do this today. So that little boy is pretty amazing. Crosby loves being able to like do some of the things for himself, like, you know, um, when they, uh, take his temperature being able to shoot the plastic part into the basket like a basketball yeah. <laughs> and like just like kind of help with with his core and so that's pretty cool 
Yeah, wherever we can get them involved. I think that's a big thing, even even adults, but especially pediatric patients. I think that is just empowering in its own way. Yeah, gives them some sort of control. Exactly, exactly. You want to say hi to everybody? Say hi, I'm Crosby. Hey, Scott. This is and my brother Amy. This is my brother. No. And then you got one more brother, right? Yeah. <laughs> but he's not really into videos. <laughs> so who you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Crosby and I go to the hospital every week. Very true. Very true. And what do you do? I do port access. That's my job. I have a job there. It's very fun. And I, yeah. But. You bring toys every week? Yes. To show the nurses? Yes. And chit chat? Yes. And you get. Otter pops. Yes. And you prank call the nurses. Yes. And you play. Yes. And you got Reba, yes. your dog, the dog. Yes. Who you love. Yes. What's the best part about the hospital? Reba. Oh, she's special. She's the specialist little doggy. <laughs> well, thank you, Crosby. They're saying hi. Hi. This is Trox speaking. And bye. <laughs> bye. 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 Such an inspiring story. Honestly, thank you so much. It, it really oh. reminds us, at least for me, like why we do what we're doing or why we're even going to healthcare. We hear stories like this. You're like, wow, okay, this is exactly why. Do you know of um have since since you're going to medical school, do you know who Tony Atkins is? I don't. Oh, that have you heard of the dancing doc? Oh, I yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I've seen his uh, I think he makes Instagram videos and whatnot of him dancing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Him and Crosby are best friends. And um, in fact, <laughs> uh last year on his birthday, Crosby was his only guest oh my god <laughs> his, his birthday party it was for him and his daughter and they had family actually it wasn't last year it was the year before because last year COVID. COVID um but we show up to their barbecue and Crosby was his guest it was so cute and um and they've actually done a NBC uh news special about them too um called people making a difference Okay. Tony Atkins and it's Crosby and him. So you might want to watch it. But um, he is, he's, people like him are what has also made the hospital so special because, you know, when Crosby had hernia surgery, um, his wife texted me and said, Is Tony there? And I said, No. And she said, Okay, I'm going to text him right now. He needs to show up right now because Crosby's about to go back. And Tony shows up. And it, Crosby isn't Tony's patient. They met and then he came to our house to trick or treat and to show his wife Crosby. And then they like hung out. And then, um, and then so yeah, for surgery, he shows up beforehand and he's not, not his patient. And um, they're, they're talking dinosaurs, Jurassic World. And then he <laughs> wills Crosby, he goes with Crosby's doctor to like make sure Crosby goes back and that he had basically like a family member with him. So he was the last person to wheel him back. And then the and then when I got to see Crosby in recovery, Tony was the first person to show up with Crosby. But um, it is just so special how, how doctors and PAs and nurses can, I'm sure that in medical school, they probably teach you not to get attached or involved but I think that's only human and that's what makes the hospital experience really wonderful is people like him that 
probably go a little bit extra of where they shouldn't, but they do. And your friends and you're not just a diagnosis and um, that, you know, they're buddies. And they finally did a dance together because Crosby, like he did with you, makes people work for it sometimes. (laughs) But he's normally not. But um, yeah, when we left California, we went over and like, and they finally did their dance. But but I'm going to really try to include awesome. that in the in the video. <laughs> we want to see Crosby dance. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So Amazing. the our hospital experience has been really personal and really great. So thank you. Thank you. It was so great to hear your story and Crosby's story and to get a little glimpse of him, even though he was too shy to talk. I know.